Welcome to Classroom 15. If you are just joining us for the webinar, it will begin in a couple of minutes and we're glad you're with us. It's four o'clock and we will start the Classroom 15 webinar in about a minute as the audience assembles. We are glad you are with us and we look forward to telling you a great story. Well, a hearty good afternoon to you. My name is Peter Laufer. I am the James Wallace Chair, Professor of Journalism here at the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. And I'm here with my former students, Julia Mueller and Zach DeMars. And, and we've got an incredible story to tell you. I, I've got the headlines here noted. Fourth graders, Cold War, FBI, Russia, rural Oregon, and pen pals, and this amazing book. Classroom 15, how the Hoover FBI censored the dreams of innocent Oregon fourth graders. It all started for us winter term 2019, in an advanced reporting class. And before you tell that tale, please, the two of you, Julia Mueller and Zach DeMars, introduce yourselves briefly because your biographies are already just too long for full details. Julia, who are you? My name is Julia. I graduated from the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication in June. Right now I'm taking a pandemic gap year and I'm working as a French and English teacher um, and also the mock trial and model United Nations coach while I'm applying to journalism grad schools. So for this project, I was the managing editor and I also co-authored a chapter. And Zach DeMars, Zach, who are you? Well, I am Zach DeMars. I am also a 2020 graduate from the University of Oregon with uh, degrees in journalism and political science. Uh, but now I am a reporter uh, on the Oregon coast uh, for the World Newspaper and its sister newspapers uh, here in the Oregon coast and in Northern Coastal California. Um, for Classroom 15, I was what we termed the lead reporter. So I authored a couple chapters and did a bunch of reporting you're gonna hear about today. And Julia, you served, as you said, as managing editor of Classroom 15. So you're in a great position to just provide us, the audience, with a synopsis. What's this book about? This book examines something that happened in 1960 in rural Oregon, in Roseburg, Oregon. What happened back then is that a fourth grade class of school children tried to start up a pen pal exchange uh, underneath a lesson they were learning in class that week called How People Work Together. 
And so the intent for uh, the project was that they find uh, people in the farthest away place they could imagine, other students to exchange letters with. And at the time, in 1960, the farthest away place they could imagine was the Soviet Union, Russia. And so uh, they wrote to the State Department to ask for help facilitating this exchange, but they were ultimately not helped by the State Department. And we'll tell you more about that lack of help later. Um, but what we did was we looked into this event that happened, but then also into kind of all of these uh, ancillary narratives that kind of moved past 1960 and explored what's happening now. And these themes that Peter mentioned of international communication, people to people communication and things like that. And Zach, uh, you were there in the classroom. You were a student in that advanced reporting class. And that day, the, the uh, well, it became uh, the mantra, a chant, but initially it was an assignment. Find that girl. And uh, tell the audience uh, what th that day was all about, please. Well, that's right. Find the girl was, uh, was the chant of the day, but it started as pretty much any other uh, January day in Eugene, cold, dark, wet, rainy. Um, we climbed to the third floor of Allen Hall as we typically did for our uh, advanced reporting, reporting to class, uh, headed by the fearless Peter Laufer. Um, the fun thing about this class and the sometimes frightening thing about this class is uh, you always have to expect the unexpected uh, when you're in any class with Peter Laufer, this one, uh, included. So uh, that day, uh, Peter joined the class with a copy of the New York Times. This, this wasn't particularly unusual. Um, he often had a copy of the New York Times. It was one of our assignments to read it uh, in the class, and sometimes he would quiz us on the day's events. But this was a different copy of the New York Times. He had uh, picked up over the weekend and found a very interesting column uh, an on this day column, a, a look back in history at a story from the past column. Um, and this one was interesting to Peter and eventually to us because it was uh, located in Roseburg, just uh, fairly close to uh, the university. And uh, it talked about this girl and her class, this girl named Janice Boyle. Um, and the reporting assignment for the day was to find this girl from a local town 60 years ago to see if she was still around, still alive and remembered that New York Times story. So we set off to, as we said, find that girl. And, and Julia, here is that, uh, where is it? It's on this side of the page. Here is that New York Times story that then was reprised in the paper I brought, brought to the class. What was so intriguing about that story? Why did it capture my imagination and then the imagination of the students, how could that turn into this book? Well, I think the original kind of allure was that, you know, the New York Times on this day column cycles through the archives and it can have, make reference to, to anything that happens nationally and just, you know, cycles through these um, random draws from history. But this one was from Roseburg, Oregon. And um, I wasn't in Peter's original reporting class, I joined later, but, the initial report, you know, we're reporting from Eugene, Oregon, from the University of Oregon. And so it had that local connection initially. And then the other thing that we discovered, uh, or rather the reporters discovered as they began working was that the New York Times article had published a misspelling of Janice's name, the fourth grade class secretary who had written to the State Department on behalf of the students in her class. And so her name, Janice I-C-E, was spelled Janice I-S, and that kind of led to an intrigue in the find that girl process that eventually led to, well, if there's something here um, that we may have misunderstood to begin with, what else can we look at that may have been misunderstood initially? Yeah, and there was a certain amount of, uh, hmm, pretty cool of us uh, because the students felt... Uh, felt a, a certain, um, well, joie de vie, speaking of your French, they felt that they had busted the newspaper of record, the old gray lady. Now, one of those students was about to go on spring break, Julia, and that played to the developmental aspect of what eventually became the book we're talking about. Yeah, because uh, when we finally found, when Janice was finally found, um, she was 
Janice Boyle back then, uh, Janice Hall now, and uh, she was living just outside of Las Vegas in Nevada. And one of the reporters from Peter's class had been planning a sorority trip uh, to Las Vegas. And, you know, when you're going to go explore the glitz and glam of, of uh, Sin City, what else would complete the journey but doing a little homework for your reporting class? So on her trip with her sorority, she went down to where Janice is living right outside of Las Vegas and had the first, you know, long form interview that this entire project, I think it really kicked off the entire project um, because that was really where we got to um, find a, a cornerstone of the narrative that we created later in terms of getting Janice's firsthand recounts um, and her memories from what happened in that classroom in 1960 and then uh, that kind of opened the door for all of the all of the different pieces that we pursued from there. Yeah, and it gave a, a new meaning to the gleeful exclamation, spring break! And uh, she had to take some time away from her plans at, at Poolside. Now, that then developed, Zach, from the initial encounter with Janice Boyle to you filing Freedom of Information Act requests and engaging in interaction via the post office with the FBI. Were, were the students naive and, and you as the lead player in these contacts with these government organizations in, in thinking that there was something there? And if there were something there, if it would be something you would get? Well, at first it did feel a little naive to be uh, banging on the door of the FBI to see if they knew anything about this little girl from 1960. Um, but eventually, fortunately, it worked out for us. Um, so to go back a little bit in one of uh, our initial conversations with Janice uh, and some of the other people involved um, in the 1960 pen pal affair, um, they had mentioned the FBI and they'd mentioned it a couple different times, a couple different ways. So we weren't really sure how the FBI was involved. Some had said there was a raid. Some had said, uh, you know, Hoover, Hoover's G-men had come to town uh, to uh, chastise these students for, you know, engaging with communist propaganda. And uh, others involved didn't quite know how the FBI uh, had touched the project. Fortunately, we, we knew that any time the federal government touches anything, they're going to leave a paper trail uh, and a mess of bureaucracy for someone else to uh, rifle through if they want. We decided that that person to rifle through all of that paperwork uh, would be me. So I filed about 13 uh, different uh, requests through the Freedom of Information Act asking uh, the FBI and the National Archives for all sorts of things, um, any profiles or dossiers they had on the players involved, on the teachers, on the community, on this, uh, this whole affair in general. Um, and eventually one of them worked out, you know, um, College students don't get a whole lot of mail. College students don't typically, uh, you know, deal a lot with letters. So uh, I lived with three other people at the time. So an apartment of four, I was the only one receiving mail. And the FBI does all of its work through the mail. So uh, apartment of four, I totally freaked my roommates out when I was just getting these flood of letters from the FBI. Of course, I knew that they were just telling me uh, that they didn't have the documents that I wanted, but eventually, uh, we got a hold of, of one file from the FBI that was really, really fascinating. It was uh, essentially the federal government's account of how this whole, uh, you know, affair with the class in Roseburg and their attempt to, to get their Russian pen pals played out and how it continued to play out domestically in the U.S. Uh, with communists from across the country sending their letter letters to this small school in Roseburg in an attempt to... Uh, give the students uh, some more information as they called it about uh, communism and the Soviet Union. So it was a, a really fascinating account from the FBI and the federal government about how, um, how they actually had in some ways been to little sleepy Roseburg, Oregon. And much of that material you obtained from the National Archives where the FBI had sent what was then a dead file. And it's uh, intriguing 
as we are putting together this tale to remember that over the portal of the main entrance to the National Archives is that throwback to Shakespeare past is prologue. And that's largely what, what this book is about, how the past is a prologue to our contemporary era and this past from a few generations back in our university home state, Oregon. Perhaps it, it's uh, nicely summed up for the audience at a time when uh, we're giving you pieces here and there by a review written by Roberta Ulrich, who is a veteran Oregonian and United Press International, if you remember the old UPI journalist, and she's author of the book, Empty Nets, Indians, Dams, and the Columbia River. And, and she wrote about the book. It is a fascinating tale, all the more remarkable because it was written not by a single author, but by a class of journalism students. The book will appeal to history buffs, not just professional historians, but average readers interested in history. It will appeal to readers who like a mystery. Who stopped the pen pal project and why? It will appeal to journalism students who will learn how a story can be divided into parts for different writers and readers, and it will be reassembled and how it can be reassembled. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think, she writes, it will appeal to readers who just like a good story. And for those like me who remember the McCarthy era, it will bring back some chilling memories. Julia, while Zach was exchanging these letters with his pals at the FBI, other students contra contacted uh, the teacher who started all of this, Bud, as he was known, Bud McFetrich. And one of the things that came out of that was one of the memes to bring us into the current era of the book, The Cedar Chest. What's The Cedar Chest all about? Well, the cedar chest, it has uh, had attached to it a bit of lore within the project um, because, you know, while Zach's looking for uh, these other documents, um, I, th I think having these physical copies, these physical documents that kind of um, bring alive each chapter is really important and interesting. And uh, especially in the sense that this project is about communication as it was in 1960, which is all written communication, and written record. Um, and so the cedar chest was owned by the McFetridge family. And I think uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this book, as uh, Roberta mentions in her review, is that it does split up. Each chapter has its own unique author voice and it explores something um, individual within each chapter. But they all kind of tie back, like wrapping around a maypole to um, this particular this set of themes, you know? And, um, one of the chapters explores the uh, life of Ray McFetridge, who was the teacher of this fourth grade class in 1960. It was his goal to try and get these students into a pen pal exchange uh, to reach beyond the Iron Curtain and get them to communicate with those people in the farthest away place they can imagine. But when there, that effort was kind of, you know, quashed by the State Department, um, what what happened was the uh, project or the effort actually gained more attention than it might have if the State Department had not sent back a denial of that request, right? So um, this project starts to pick up steam. First, it's published in the local paper. And as Peter showed you at the beginning of this meeting, it works its way all the way up to the New York Times. So this tiny story about how a group of students is trying to communicate, uh, you know, in the time of the Red Scare with kind of the the country that kind of exemplifies that contemporary fear, uh, it, it picks up uh, and it get, gains a little bit more notoriety locally, but then eventually on the national scale and eventually it makes its way to Pravda, which is the Russian paper. And so um, this tiny project, you know, the State Department had denied it to the point where oh, they didn't think they would be able to exchange letters with anyone, but because of the attention that it gained, uh, the school did start receiving letters and Ray McFetridge and the students in the class did start re uh, 
receiving letters from you know, the local area at first when it was published in the Roseburg News Review, the local paper, and then from people across the country once it made its way to the New York Times, people who wanted to write either in support of the students or in support of the State Department who had you know, stopped this fear of propaganda or this potential for propaganda that the students might have received. Um, and then whenever it made its way to the Russian news outlets, they started receiving letters from Russia, which was the original intent that they thought would not ever occur. Um, but in fact, Ray McFetridge did receive to the school a series of letters from teachers and students in Russia who wrote on the back of postcards, one of which Peter might show you is um, duplicated on the cover of our book here. And um, these letters came from students and teachers. We've poured through them. We've had them translated uh, to, to the best of our knowledge. They contain no state secrets or anything um, propagandizing um, the weather and children's favorite hobbies for, uh, between Russia and the United States or the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, but what's interesting is, uh, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about this later, we were able to find record of these letters that came from the United States and came from Russia. But these Russian letters in particular, which Ray McFetridge received, uh, were never shown to the students in the class. And he kept them. And I think it's important to note that he kept them. He didn't simply throw them away or leave them at the front desk of the school. He took them to his home and he put them in, and this is our motif, the uh, cedar chest in his family home. And so uh, Ray McCutridge has passed away since um, uh, we've written the story. And um, so we, we were able to talk to his family and his family generously showed us all of the letters that were kept in the cedar chest. And many of them are reproduced throughout the book. And they really are gorgeous. Again, if you take a look at the, at the uh, calligraphy, at the Cyrillic letters, at the stamps, at that Soviet era graphic design and color, we felt quite privileged to get copies of these, uh, th these uh, communications that we had thought for so long had either been destroyed by the FBI, destroyed by the school, or just lost in the repositories of the federal government. So we had then, Zach, quite the pile of material. What were we going to do with this? What happened next? Well, at this time, we had the letters uh, that, that you just talked about. And um, we had some of the FBI documents and we had some interviews with some other people. And so we, uh, we all kind of decided that this was, uh, this was more than just the class assignment it had started uh, as. By this time, uh, the, the winter term was long since over. Um, Peter, you had, you had long since doled out your Fs to everybody in the class. And uh, we- A pack uh, of losers for sure. <laughs> we, we had all decided that this project was so interesting and exciting to us that we all wanted to, uh, to stay on board and to, to keep uh, reporting and keep writing and, and keep, uh, you know, this project, one of the, the really interesting things with this project, it's just kind of kept going. Um, every turn, uh, uh, corner we turned down, it seemed like there was another corner uh, that we could turn the other way around. There was just so many serendipitous moments and interesting things that came up. So it was at this point that, that we decided we would continue on with it. And uh, you continued to tell us uh, that we are not writing a book, um, though we can see how well that turned out. Yeah, low expectations. And uh, again, to show off the cover of Classroom 15, high rewards. And, and then Julia, we invited Janice Boyle to come home to Oregon and to come meet with us. We, we took her out to a gala dinner because we were after immersing ourselves for so long in her life story and that which occurred around the Classroom 15 project. We, we were intrigued to get to know this woman who was well past uh, social security, um, uh, what is it called, uh, when, when, you, when you're uh, in a position to be able to collect and, uh, and, and we uh, age and we, um, we met a vibrant, 
bubbly woman who just opened her, her uh, heart and her memory to us. And you were there taking notes. Yeah, when Janice came to Eugene, it was just a couple weeks after I had joined the project. And Peter, you and Zach had both asked me, I think, initially to come and copy it at a couple chapters, um, which were at that point longer forms of your, your final project that everyone had written, Peter. Uh, 500 word essays or articles um, kind of embracing what they had each individually researched. And so um, my, my job as it expanded from copy editor to managing editor was in those first couple weeks of my involvement to look at the project and see where we could take this in, form, in, in terms of a longer form narrative or a book project, although assuredly we were not writing one. Um, and part of that was looking at each chapter, seeing what leads we were starting to pursue because it was still early days in the project at that point. And so I think that a lot of the earlier drafts of the chapters kind of provided more questions for the authors than they had provided answers at that point, which was good for the longevity of the project in terms of having so much, many more questions to, to hound down and answer. And as we were looking at all of it and fitting it together and storyboarding, seeing what still needed to be researched, how we could expand each chapter, um, we kind of started to draw connections between the themes that you mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, but themes of communication and, um, you know, borders and international relations and this idea of the government and the people and the interplay there. Um, and another big theme was journalism. So uh, when Janice came to town uh, for the first time, we got to, or I got to interview her for a second time. That first time had been in Las Vegas uh, with another reporter. And then I interviewed her when she came here to Eugene. And I talked to her more about the broader scope of her life. And interestingly enough, this project that had, it seemed at the start, you know, it, it seemed as though Janice was the, the kindling. And then there was a whole other story kind of separate from her, um, from her particular narrative. But as it turns out, you know, her, life story kind of has this connection to a lot of the other things in this story. It is all very serendipitous. Um, there's a massive theme of journalism throughout. Janice herself wanted to be a journalist, uh, you know, from, from her 15 minutes of fame in the Roseburg News Review to working at a uh, clerk's office later in her life and wanting to pursue um, news as a career you know, we were student journalists working on this project to uncover something that we had found through the New York Times and through a local paper. And so it's kind of this multi-layered meta um, theme of journalism throughout. And so uh, what I did once Janice came to town was write a chapter to try and connect all of these themes and make sure that this story that was kind of disparate in examining different things like Ray McFetridge and the Congressman Charles Porter at the time, the State Department, Zach's chapters about Hoover's G-men kind of coming to town um, and see how we could fit all of that together within this one book, which was kind of and ambitious it, at the time. But it, it was quite ambitious, quite ambitious at the time. And in the chapter that you wrote uh, titled Progress and the Press, that's something you address, and I'll read an excerpt from that. The narrow focus of the book, Julia writes, of the Janus 101 research, we started to call the class Janus 101 as she became a lead character, is on the life of just one young girl from one small classroom in one small town in the 1960s. And yet this book reaches into the annals of history and expands the life of an ordinary person into a quasi-historical figure, highlighting the dramatic up and down swings of her life, attaching her to political movements and using her story as an example of the American experience during McCarthyism and the Cold War. These themes aren't unique to Janice's life, Journalism permeates the stories of many of the Pen Pal Project's main characters in the book. Ray McFetrich's son, Scott, is a news editor for the Associated Press in Nebraska and Iowa. What this story makes clear is that whether or not someone has a direct connection 
to the professional journalist's world, every American life has been impacted on some level by some form of journalism. Reporting is the gatekeeper of fact and foil to governmental censorship. It was, after all, the Roseburg News Review that initially brought Classroom 15 into the spotlight so effectively, in fact, that letters came from the Soviet Union to the Riverside School, even if those letters were never seen by the school children there. And it was, after all, the New York Times that first exposed our cohort of University of Oregon journalism students to rediscover the Classroom 15 story and delve into its complexities from the chapter that Julia wrote in the book. And, and Julia, at this point in the story of the creation of the book, you and the rest of us, but you and your role as managing editor realized we needed to flesh out Roseburg a little bit to tell the story of 1959, 1960, small town America. And we needed to provide at least some background because it's so long ago now regarding the Cold War. So you made some assignments. Yes, so once we decided the kind of broader narrative arc that we wanted to pursue for the story with each individual chapter going after their specific questions but kind of wrapping it all into a, you know, a, a line that kind of made sense, a, a timeline of the story. Um, we decided that we've kind of had three separate parts of, of the book as it was taking place, but as again, was not happening. Um, the initial part of the story was kind of a focus on Janice and what happened specifically on that day in January, 1960. Then uh, this middle part, it was kind of, we felt that we needed to start expanding it, right? So how does Janice's story relate to what was happening in history at the time, what was happening in her town and in small town America generally at that time? And then the, the tail end of the book, uh, starts off with this progress in the press chapter and pushes into um, a bit more about uh, the more modern or more contemporary uh, connections that we were able to draw with the story, which we'll talk about more later, so I won't spoil it. But this, this middle part was kind of central to providing context, like Peter said, for why any of this was happening, because we did have a lot of whys that, you know, to this point, we still aren't able to ever completely answer, but looking through history and looking through these documents, we can start to kind of um, you know, sift through and find some traces of an answer to these questions. But the, why did Ray McFetridge want to do this lesson on how people work together? Why, when his students suggested that they communicate with the Soviet Union, did he not immediately say no? Why did he encourage them to write to the State Department? Why did the State Department, when they received that request, say no? And so we had all of these questions that we needed to see. Obviously, we can't reach and ask anybody um, who was an adult at that time, because Janice herself is now um, you know, older. Um, but what we could do was use the context of what was happening at the time to answer those questions, right? The Red Scare, this kind of generalized anxiety and fear of the other, um, this worry about propaganda coming in to the children specifically was a big anxiety that we found in a lot of the research that we did, right? Uh, which, which makes sense, this fear of the other is nothing new, but I think the specific fear of propaganda coming in through this very, you know, protected sense of like, well, the mail that you get as a child should be about the weather and your favorite things to do and things, you know, and, and this, this concern that something more sinister could come through something as innocent as a nice letter in the mail um, was a not obviously not unique to Janice's specific story. And so we have uh, a couple chapters in the middle that discuss what Roseburg was like as a town, specifically in rural Oregon, right? So that we get some context for the specificity of where Janice grew up and where this was all taking place. And then another chapter that discusses what was happening in America at the time and these things like fear of propaganda, this constant concern, um, you know, nuclear fear, just this generalized red scare of sometimes people didn't even really understand what they were afraid of. They just knew that there was this fear that they had to wake up with in the morning. 
And, um, you know, with that context, I think we were able to provide a little bit more of the implied why answer to these questions of why did this garner such a reaction? Why did the Roseburg News Review even cover this? Why did the New York Times and Pravda cover it, right? Um, and so the, the context chapters in the middle help us understand, you know, why this is even important to us now. And, and then they kind of kick off into the last third of the book, at least as I envision it, um, uh, because the, the, the later third talks about, you know, now. And so these questions about what was happening then kick off into what is happening now, most of which, or some of which is rather the same in terms of this anxiety and fear of others. Disturbingly the same. And at this point, Zach, we started to change the chant from, we're not writing a book to maybe we're writing a book. And this is a good time about halfway through our program here with you. And we're so glad that you're watching and listening to remind you that the book is Classroom 15, How the Hoover FBI Censored the Dreams of Innocent Oregon Fourth Graders. It's published by Anthem Press. And of course, it's available at your local independent bookseller and even Amazon. And so, Zach, we thought maybe a book. And uh, we, we had one of our vibrant meetings and realized that something, even though we had collected so much material, was missing. Well, that's right. You know, Julia mentioned all of those kind of questions that we had, uh, you know, every time we found something out about this story, we ended up with, with more questions. And uh, that context that Julia was talking about did a lot of the work to answer those questions, but there were still some questions um, that were left unanswered. The time that we started um, working on this project, uh, one of the biggest stories in the national media in the US was about election interference in the 2016 presidential election uh, and the subsequent fallout um, for the various players in that. So, so that was a lot of the context that we were thinking in at the time and, and that we were doing this work in at the time. And so the, the kind of obvious question for us was, well, it's been 60 years. Uh, if we were to try again and, and reignite a pen pal relationship uh, between Southern Oregon and somewhere uh, in Russia, what would happen? Would it, would it succeed? Would the State Department squash us? Would we be raided by the FBI? We didn't quite know. Um, serendipitously, we had, uh, we had a contact in a Southern Oregon uh, fourth grade classroom. And uh, so we got some- not, not let me interrupt you, not just a contact. Remember, it was one of the students in the class and he has a little sister. And at the time she was- A fourth grader in Southern Oregon which uh, is exactly what we were looking for. Um, so her class uh, wrote a couple of letters uh, to uh, potential future uh, pen pals in Russia. They didn't know who they would be, where they would be. Um, I would hesitate to believe that they all quite knew uh, where Russia was on a map because they're in the fourth grade and who knows those sorts of things. Um, and so we have these letters and, and we're ready to do something with them. Um, eventually we get to, we get to October. Um, so it's been a winter term, a spring term, a summer break, uh, with work all throughout those work, writing, editing, reporting, uh, the book. And then we get to October and we're thinking about what, uh, the book needs, uh, to actually become a book and actually be successful. One of those things we decided was Julia's chapter, uh, kind of tying all those themes together. But the other was to answer that question, what would happen? if we tried again. So, uh, so you we decided, dusted off your passport. I did, I dusted off my passport. We decided in that meeting somehow that I of all people uh, should be the person to spend a week of my winter break in the middle of December in Moscow, uh, Russia and Rostov on Don, Russia which is a 13 hour train ride south of Moscow. Um, I kept the notes from that October meeting where I uh, got this lovely assignment. Um, the most common piece of punctuation on these notes is a question mark. Uh, 
Russia, question mark. Visa stuff, question mark. Contact info, question mark. So there were a lot of questions, but uh, through some more serendipitous connections, um, we found a fourth grade class in uh, Rostovon Don, Russia. It's Rostovon Don is where um, the European and Asian continents meet. So some say the city is actually uh, in both uh, continents. I took a train down there, 13 hour train ride. I met with some of these students, uh, delivered these letters to them. Um, they were just very excited to see the letters. They, uh, they gave presentations about themselves here in the photo that Peter's got up. Um, the students were singing about, uh, about themselves and about their lives. And um, the particularly exciting thing was that this is, uh, this is a kind of a unique school when you think about it in the American context, these students um, from kindergarten to 11th grade, um, they learn three languages by the time they leave this school, which is, uh, if you're doing the math, two languages more than most uh, American public school students do. So um, these students, uh, even the fourth graders were proficient in English better than some adults uh, are at English that I know. Um, so these students were very excited to be able to speak with uh, a native English speaker and write letters back and forth with native English speakers. Um, eventually throughout the week, uh, by the end of the week, I, I had a, a, a packet of letters from these students um, written back to their new friends in Southern Oregon. Um, they had written, as you may have guessed, um, about all of the things that Julia mentioned before, the weather, the size of their classes, uh, their favorite artists, um, the sports they like to play, all of these uh, very obvious fourth grade things. Um, and I uh, boarded a plane, had a 34 hour day uh, back to Eugene. And uh, we eventually returned those letters to our friends in Yonkala, Oregon, which uh, those students now have them. So we, uh, we, we, finally, we finally found the way to, to close the loop, not only on the 60 year story of this pen pal attempt, um, but conveniently, we also got uh, kind of the bookends for the narrative uh, of the story as well. And uh, that, uh, that's something magic that connects young Kala with Rostov was, was captured by another reviewer, Tom Booth, who is the director of the Oregon State University Press, writes about Classroom 15. Two Oregon classrooms separated by 70 miles and 60 years are brought together by a brief New York Times clipping, an engaging mix of investigative reporting and storytelling. Classroom 15 uncovers a long forgotten footnote in Oregon and Cold War history. I never thought I'd see Jan Kala and Rostov on Don in the same sentence. While it raises important questions about our current national politics, hats off to the intrepid student journalists at the University of Oregon who have brought this fascinating story to light. And so that's after we got a publisher, Julia, we realized, yes, we have a book. Yes, we, we sent this student halfway around the world and and he came back to Oregon realizing what winter really is, but we needed to find a, a publisher. Yes, well, and I think it's important that we mention that at the time that we sent Zach to Russia, we were in the middle of kind of our first wave of publishing pushes as we were sending this out to different publishing houses. Um, and so I, I did make him write both chapters on the plane back at least early drafts. And so I, he's got to brag a little bit about that because he, he did get it done. So as, as managing editor, I'm very proud. Um, but yeah, we were looking um, for this project that we initially had said was assuredly not a book um, to try and send it to publishing houses to see if it could become a book. Um, we tried a couple different places and eventually found Anthem Press, which is an international publishing house in uh, London, New York, Melbourne and Delhi. And um, we, they have been wonderful to work with. They have been so open to making sure that we can maintain the integrity of a couple different things that we think is really important about the project. One being the, um, the pub publication of the postcards and the images that are in the book. Um, 
the reprintings of those uh, because there are these kinds of very salient images of uh, that are scans of documents, um, FOIA requests, little samples that you know kind of added a different layer to this book uh, that I think highlights the fact that you you don't really find out until the very end when we get into it in our uh, process epilogue where we kind of peel back the curtain and go through what we each did as individual students and reporters at the time. Um, but I, I think it adds this kind of scrapbook journalism that reinforces the idea that this was a collaborative effort, that this is very much physically and literally pasting together, cutting and clipping together different pieces of history. Um, and so um, uh, published in the book there, as Peter may show you some more images, um, we have just a variety of different documents and photos and visuals that- Yeah, um, some of them, for example, this uh, clipping from the Roseburg News Review that kicked off the international publicity. So to find, as Julia says, these original documents, documents that Zach got from the National Archives that were FBI documents and to be able to include them in the book as visual representations of the originals, we felt really added strength to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, given that the initial idea for this project was taken, you know, ripped from a headline, um, I think that it's in keeping that throughout the rest of the chapters, we make reference to a lot of newspaper clippings and things like that. Um, as we worked with Anthem, we did a couple different rounds of edits on the book. Um, there, in the process of working with other publishing houses along the way, we had done a lot of substantial edits and done a lot of the writing. Uh, so by the time that we found Anthem, we had a really solid piece, um, I think close to 100,000 words at the time, and we ended up cutting it back. So that was a long way from starting out with uh, a dozen 500 word articles for class. We ended up having to scale back on the writing and the research that we had done. Um, and so we worked through a couple rounds of, of smaller edits with Anthem, just fixing things up for publication, making sure that things were typeset and all of that. And um, we were off to the races with publishing. Yeah, and, and an example of uh, the, uh, the reception that the book has uh, enjoyed is, uh, is uh, the foreword. And the foreword is written by Anne Curry. You in the audience may know her from her years, <coughs> excuse me, as an NBC News correspondent. We know her as a Southern Oregonian who grew up down the street from us and is an alumna of the University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication. And this, this is her brief but salient forward or forward to the book. And it is as follows. A good story can get into your bones. For a time, it can almost feel a part of you, eliciting surprise and delight and a drive to discover what happens next? This story about what happened in an America embroiled by McCarthyism during the Cold War, when curious elementary school children tried to communicate with children in Russia was compelling enough when it was first reported, including in the New York Times, but it has never been so riveting as it is now finally fully told. The surprise is in its newly uncovered nuances. The delight is in its mysteries revealed. The story of what happened next covers 60 years of developments in America and in Russia, the involvement of the FBI and the unlikely discovery of a box of letters. The team of intrepid reporters that uncovered all of this through persistence, investigative journalism, as well as shoe leather reporting, proves that there is great value in doing what is too rarely done, following up on stories and being open to wherever they take you. This good story now before you, Anne Curry writes in the foreword, reflects the true adventure of pure journalism. It is an example of why truth is both hard to find 
and worth the effort. Plus, it includes an old recipe for apple butter spice cake, which I, for one, am eager to taste. And, and that apple butter spice cake, Julia, comes out of the Roseburg chapter that you assigned. And the author quite cleverly, I believe, brought Roseburg in 1959 and 1960 to life via the local newspaper, the News Review. How did she do that? Yeah, kind of like I was mentioning with, um, you know, reproducing the images in the book, uh, very much a scrapbook style. She has inserted as she went through the chapter, dissecting what Roseburg was like, what was happening at the time. Um, the Roseburg blast was a, a big thing. Uh, a explosion had shattered her, um, her family's jewelry store. And there's this detail uh, that she remembers about her father having to pick diamonds out of the glass. And so that, that chapter deals with a bunch of details about Roseburg at the time, and they're reinforced by clippings from the Roseburg News Review. Uh, and as she went through, she found things like a recipe and other kind of contemporary articles about fashion or culture or trends or things that were happening in the town at that time to give it a little bit more um, depth. Yeah, I'm just glancing through here now to uh, provide a couple more of those examples. One of the things that, that's uh, entertaining from this distance, I think, is when she, she uh, picks out of advertisements, grocery store advertisements, the price of uh, food. Of course, remember how much people who were employed at the time were making on the average, but uh, she has the Albers Flapjack mix at 39 cents for a four pound bag and uh, Morel's Pried Bacon at 33 cents a pound for the bacon and, and uh, the this, this syrup to go with a bottle of syrup to go with the flapjacks, 59 cents. And one of the things that this does, I believe, is help us uh, realize the, the world that existed at the time during these Cold War stresses, but also some of, at least from our vantage point, the innocence of the time. Yes, there was the fear of the other, and there was the hiding under the desk for the duck and cover exercises. But there, oh, there was also, at least uh, for people in a town like Roseburg, for many of the people, a, a sense of, uh, of innocence that was not shared universally across the country. And that again, brings us up to contemporary times in the book where movements like Black Lives Matter show that this type of innocence expressed in the Roseburg chapter was not shared, especially given at the time, the fraught history of Oregon as a state, vast majority of the population, a state with the vast majority of the population, white as a legacy of the times during territorial, the territorial era and early statehood when there were exclusion laws in effect in Oregon. This book, because of that time period from the late 50s to our era, I think helps us understand that earlier history that we're faced with now. Zach, we need a story from you wandering the streets of Moscow that helped set up the beginning of the book the chapter, the first chapter that you tell in the first person as uh, you are not an American in Paris, but an American in Moscow. Right, so yeah, so, so the, the very start of, of the book and, and the narrative of the book is actually first person, which uh, we, had, we had long conversations about whether or not it was appropriate to even use the first person in a book like this. But um, so, so this was uh, my last night in Russia. I was in Moscow. I'd chosen to take an extra day or two to spend in Moscow because I don't know the next time I'll be in Moscow, uh, particularly uh, in December when the, uh, the lights are up and the um, crispness is in the air, I suppose you could say. But so this was my last night in Moscow and it was getting dark and it was, uh, of course, rather cold. Um, 
and I had been uh, walking around uh, Red Square and the Kremlin for most of the day, just looking at many of the things that uh, there are to look at because there are quite a few. Um, and I, I came across a park um, just south of the Kremlin. You can almost, you can kind of see the, the red walls uh, and the tall spires uh, of, of the Kremlin from this park. And in this park, um, there's, a, there's a little monument and uh, it's a fascinating monument. It's it's a little uh, it's a little absurd to think about uh, having this monument, but <clears throat> the the title of the monument and the sculptures um, is called "Victim." Uh, ch excuse me, children are the victims of adult vices. So uh, it's a really fascinating little plaza. There's these two children, as you can see uh, in the photo there. There's there's two children uh, blindfolded playing in the middle of this plaza these statues and all around them are uh, a, a dozen or so statues representing uh, these adult vices. So uh, things like uh, ignorance is, is the biggest one here, but war, ignorance, uh, irresponsible science, uh, weaponry, all, all of these sorts of very adult problems. Um, and they're all looking in at these children that are just playing innocently um, uh, in the center of them, blindfolded, totally blind to these uh, tall black figures around them. Um, these children are, are standing there playing and it was just, it was another one of these really incredibly serendipitous moments. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm across the globe, I'm, I'm in this random park um, on a very cold night when I should probably be uh, somewhere indoors. And there's this park that I think speaks to one of the many themes of the book, this idea that children are the victims of adult vices. Um, you, you look at uh, the situation in 1960 and, and the events of 1960 when these kids just wanted to be pen pals. Uh, as far as we know, these kids just wanted to be pen pals uh, with friends in Russia. And as far as we know, um, Ray McFetteridge just wanted to teach uh, his students uh, how people work together by, by engaging them in this conversation. But uh, so these, these children just wanted to do something childlike. They wanted to be the little statues there playing in the middle of the park, but uh, they got kind of caught up in all of these adult vices uh, with this fear of propaganda and the bureaucracy um, from the State Department, the inquiry by the FBI. And uh, it really speaks to, I think, how, how all of that got overblown um, but that night was was really serendipitous to to walk upon that and and see uh, that monument. And there were actually quite a few people, even though it was cold, um, who had had stopped by and had walked through that park. And and uh, all of them stopped and looked in that monument for for a few moments. So it was it was really quite serendipitous that night. Well, we've pretty much told the story we're going to tell you. And before we say goodbye, I'm going to ask Zach and Julia to tell us some of the lessons that they take away from this uh, spontaneous assignment I gave back in the winter term 2019 to find that girl. But first, I, I want to read to you the ending of the afterword written by Scott McFetrich, the son again of Bud McFetrich, the teacher who started all of this, and Scott McFetrich, now a reporter and editor for Associated Press in, in uh, the Midwest. <clears throat> so here we are, nearly 60 years after Bud McFetrich came up with an idea for making a difference to fourth graders at Riverside School in Roseburg, writes Scott McFetrich. What dad may not have realized is that even as politicians and bureaucrats thwarted his attempt to help students understand their world and maybe break down barriers between so-called enemies, his work succeeded in spotlighting the government's puzzling attempts to build a wall between students. Only a year before an actual wall, was erected in Berlin. And now many years later, the work of UO students has put this simple effort into a historical context, letting us understand how a failed school project says so much about our country in an earlier era and today. 
to those University of Oregon School of Journalism and Communication students. Thank you for working to gather the information needed to finally tell this story. And thank you for letting me learn more about my father who put so much value on teaching and had such care for his family and students. It always uh, touches my hard, cold journalist heart when, when I read that. And so please, uh, Zach, you first, and then Julia. What, what Zach, are a handful of the lessons you've learned? Well, um, I, you know, one of the lessons, of course, is uh, the importance of a good coat and warm gloves. Um, but aside from that, um, I think one of the most interesting things about this is just the, the power and importance of an interesting story. Um, you know, it's not, it's not, nothing here is terribly profound. Um, it's some fourth graders who wanted to be pen pals and then some adults said no. And the fourth graders, most of them don't remember it today. They were on their merry way after uh, their 15 minutes of fame. But, um, but there's a lot that we can derive from that story, even though it's just, a, it's just an interesting story about history. And I think there's a lot that we can derive and that we have uh, learned from all of that. And, and so I've, I've really learned the importance of the very small and minute, uh, just human stories that don't seem profound on the surface. And, um, you know, Peter, you were, you were talking earlier about how the book kind of shows some of the naivety uh, of the time or, or some of the, the, the quietness of the time and um, how that's different from today. I, I actually think that's, it also shows the naivety of today or the ability to focus on these uh, small and human stories that, that we can today. Because, you know, if you, if you were to look around us right now, there is plenty of other things uh, that we could be focusing on. There's a pandemic, there's, uh, you know, unrest in our nation's capital and state capitals around the country, there's no shortage of things to be focusing on, but um, we have chosen this interesting story uh, merely because it's interesting and, and because we want to derive some lessons from it. So uh, I think that's the key lesson I have, have derived from it uh, is, is the ability of, to just think about and, and consider an interesting and important story in, in a small and detailed way. Well, then I'll, I'll change uh, based on, on, on that. Uh oral essay, I'll change your C minus to a C plus for the class. Julia, what, what lessons do you take uh, away from this experience? I think similarly, we've talked a lot today about serendipity because a lot of what we were able to draw out of uh, this story was, you know, it seemed at the time like a big stroke of luck. She's going to Las Vegas, a person we could interview is in Las Vegas. Uh, you know, these little links that we've been mentioning throughout of whether it's journalism or someone, be, you know, Scott McFetridge working for AP and Janice wanting to work for AP and all of these different things. Um, but I, I think that that is um, a lesson that I learned, but I think that this story continues to kind of tell, especially as we get into um, revealing our process at the end of the book and the epilogue is that, you know, it's history's rhyme, right? You know, it is all very interconnected and the things that we have been able to, with this story, kind of dredge up and showcase from what was happening in 1960 and these sentiments and anxieties or what have you that was happening then, um, you know, we can, we can make those or draw those parallels to, to today. And um, I think that the, the, connectedness of um, both the things that were happening then and the things that are happening now and the connectedness of everyone in this story to either a theme or someone else in this story or another place in this story um, is, is serendipitous for us as journalists, but is actually kind of just more indicative of the fact that everything, all of this story that we tell no matter how specific it is that we pick it up and find an interesting story all the interesting stories kind of connect and you can follow one through to all the rest of them indeed and thank you all for listening and watching we hope you find classroom 15 as intriguing as we have we hope you get yourself a copy and we hope that you 
enjoy reading it. And we would love to hear from you. You can find us at the email address that has been up. And if you aren't watching, Julia, what is that email address? Classroom15book at gmail.com. And all of our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they're all classroom15book with the 15 uh, numerical, so one five. And join us there and we'll continue the story because we still want to see what letters the Jan Kala school writes back to Rostov on Dom and there they both are again in the same sentence. Thank you again. I'm Peter Laufer, until the next time.